Okay, so the next thing I would like to discuss is um, something which is called the skeleton, which we can actually see as a simplification of a binary image. So we consider that we have written this letter P, for example, over here with a very thick pen. And what we want to do is we want to find a simplified version of this drawn figure that I can just represent with, a sing with, with lines. So something going from here to here is the best explanation. So again, this is a simplification of what we see here, but for a lot of tasks, it's kind of relevant or sufficient um, if we only have this kind of sketch-like representation of the object that we are considering. And what I would like to explain you now how we actually move from here to here. So what are efficient ways for finding this skeleton? So the first thing, if to, if, before we want to answer this question, the question is what actually defines this skeleton? So what is a reason why a point is labeled black in here compared to this image? And there are actually three different views on how we can actually see a skeleton, what a skeleton can be. And I would like to ask you now, what are possible explanations how you would explain the skeleton, the simplification? Um, yeah, we can see that actually at the pass, which is most away, furthest away from all the borders. It's actually useful in robotics if you want to plan a pass. You drive along this pass and all these things are obstacles. That's actually the pass which maximizes the distance to the obstacles. That's a good point. So what is important about the distance? Because so if I, if I selected this point, for example, this point over here, is a very long distance to this one, that's great, but a short distance to this one, which is bad. So distance is a pretty good criterion. What makes, the distance, what makes it important with respect to the distance? You more or less said that, but you can even say that a bit more explicitly. More explicit. You need to check every edge. Uh, the smallest distance to every edge needs to be maximum. To every. Yeah. Every is not correct. <laughs> yes. So if you want to maximize this, that's true, if you want to maximize the distance to the nearest point, what do you need to do, what, what does this imply? Yeah? yeah, no, other edge is nearer than this edge. So I'm farther away from this edge than I'm from that edge. That's exactly the, if you're at that point, you're not done yet. Then you haven't found the right one. Then, you, then there's the better point. And you, and you're, you reach the, your goal if you, every point has at least two points from which it is furthest away. So if you have a point here, the distance to here to here, to both sides, should be maximized. So if this is the case, so if I have two points, the, 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 every point in here has the shortest distance to the border to at least two bordering border points, maybe more, but at least two. That's kind of the first explanation for obtaining this structure. What would be a second explanation for obtaining that? How could we obtain that? How could we compute that? Consider I give you a piece of wood which has exactly this shape and you should transform this piece of wood into this skeleton. How would you do that? Or a fruit. Exactly, we are peeling our figure. So we could peel away layer by layer so it gets thinner and thinner and thinner until there's only a single, let's say, element left. And this actually gives us this figure. That's actually your second explanation. What is the third explanation? Third explanation is actually a little bit related to the first one. It has something to do with distances and it has something to do with circles. Exactly. So all those points, 
can be seen as the center points of circles or the maximum radius that means they connect at least two different points on the border Oops, this is just sorry this is just the explanation of what we said in here um, the first one was the minimum distance that we said before the second one was we have a set of circles which lie fully inside the border and touch the border at least twice or two different locations or the third one was actually the kind of peeling away or seeing this as a brush fire so we start a fire outside and it's kind of where the fire meets so this, it can be nicely visualized by those figures over here so this one is the idea with those circles so this point over here for example is given because we can fit this circle in there which lies fully inside our figure and touch it in this case three times but two is sufficient so there's another one with two and all those circles I can actually fit in there actually then gives me this structure and this one is related to the first example that we had because we know that the the circle has a constant radius and if I touch it at least at two different locations this is exactly the kind of the first point that you had you want to maximize those distance and to at least two different points and this is ex gives exactly or leads to the circle or we see it kind of at the brush fire view so say we, we start a fire all at the border let the fire burn assuming the fire um, moves with a constant speed these are actually those lines where the flames meet and then we actually get this structure kind of two explanations of the same thing as I said intuitively we can simply peel our figure and then at some point in time we actually need to stop we actually want to use this approach to actually derive or to come up with an algorithm which allows us to compute that so if we just peel away one layer layer by layer the important thing we need to identify is when should we when do we need to stop so consider we have this figure over here so these are kind of here nine pixels here nine pixels and here's one pixel we can peel it away further and further but the question is when do we need to stop so the key question is should we remove or should we keep this pixel if you kind of peel away layer by layer what do you think should we keep it or should we remove it someone said keep why exactly so we don't want to remove that otherwise we would break one component into two different components and it should make sense if we have a component we break it into two different components if you then ex compute the skeleton for both sides we would end up with a different skeleton because the important thing is we will never want to break the, the, the component because breaking the component would mean we would break up the skeletons and end up with having two skeletons which is not what we want right so if you kind of peel our fruit we don't never want to peel it so that actually the fruit breaks into two parts so how does the skeleton look like in this example so if this is kind of now we have whatever three by six or by seven doesn't matter how would the skeleton look like would that point be on the skeleton no Would that point be on the skeleton yes so this is one point which would be on the skeleton what about this point over here yes or no oh it would the distance to this border and this border the same distance you can actually fit a circle directly in here and would touch this twice so this would have been there this this and of course this as well this as well symmetrically going upwards so these are the pixels I would need to select as my skeleton points you can later on say maybe we can prune that away because I don't really want them but if we go from the definition that we started with the, with the circles the centers of the circles those points or those lines are actually part of the skeleton so depending on my application I may remove uh, those bordering points is just start here but just want to have a minimum length but in general this is there according to the definition that we actually provided so it seems for those points the number of neighbors matters so how many neighbors does a point have one two three if you're only three neighbors it's typically a part of a skeleton because it's one of the bordering points if you have a point over here which has a large number of different neighbors maybe that's something which we also may take into account as a criterion of where I should kind of peel it away or should stick with it 
And this actually, these are actually the two important criterion, criteria. The first thing is, I don't want to break my figure into two parts. And the second thing is, I want to make sure I don't have one of those endpoints. The, the question of an endpoint is simply made by how many neighbors does the point have. So endpoints are points with less than four neighbors in an N8 neighborhood. So assume, take this, this definition into account. So for example, this point over here has one neighbor. This is this point over here. This one has two neighbors, one and two in an eight neighborhood. Those points both have three neighbors. So those would be endpoints. This one over here, on the other hand, is one, two, three, four neighbors would not be an endpoint. And, th and those one with five neighbors also would not be an endpoint. So what the algorithm now says is, okay, for all pixels which lie at the north, south, east, or west border, we start with north, south, east, west, we peel it away, that means we eliminate that, either if we don't break it, cut the component apart, or if it has less than four neighbors. It's, yeah, less than four neighbors, we keep it, and we also keep it if we would break the structure apart. And otherwise, we simply remove it. Okay, let's have a look how this algorithm now works. So we said we start from north, south, east, west. So we start from the north. So all the pixels which are at the border towards north, I'm now considering. So this is this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel. Let's start from north. So everything which is labeled as one are those pixels which are now eliminated, peeled away in the first step. So I start with this one over here. I said, okay, this one only has one, two, three neighbors. Oh, it's an endpoint. We don't remove it. We keep it. That's why I made, made the dot in there. Let's look to the next one. Let's, start with, let's go to this one over here. So how many neighbors does this guy have? One, two, three, four, five. I don't need it. I can peel it away. Okay, this gets a one because we're in our first pass. Then this pixel has a border to the north. It has one, one, two, three, uh, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six neighbors. Perfectly go away. This one has one, two, three, four, five neighbors. Can perfectly go away. This one has one, two, three neighbors. Oh, three neighbors. Keep it. So we're going to keep that. We have more pixels here from the north, border to the north. This one over here, one, two, three, four, five, perfectly goes away. And we can do the same for this one as well. One, two, three, four, pick four neighbors. Move it away. And now, there are no further pixels which have a border to the north. Okay, so what I now do is, now I kind of, what I did, I labeled them for peel them away, and now I'm actually peeling them away after the first iteration is over. So now I'm cutting them out. And from now on, they are not considered anymore for the, if I count the number of neighbors. So, so far, so for this one, for counting the neighbors of this pixel, I said one, two, three, four. I still counted this one. I just labeled it so far with the one. But now I'm kind of peeling it away. And now I said, okay, second step, start from south. So now number two, my second iteration. So I start with those which have a border to the south. So this one is a pixel which has a border to the south. But it only has one, two, three neighbors. So this is not counted now because this has been peeled away in the first iteration. So one, two, three. Okay, good one, I keep that. Now let's go to the next one. I'm here saying, okay, I have one, two, three, four, five neighbors. Perfectly, peel it away. Next one, one, two, three, four neighbors. So I still count this one. One, two, three, four, peel it away. Again, this one, one, two, three, four, peel it away. And then we, this one will be next one. So this one, one, two, three, four, five, perfect, can go away. This one, again, and here again. Okay? So the next step, I labeled all pixel which have a border to the south. So there's no other pixel which has a border to the south which is, has not been labeled. I'm done with my iteration, so I'm kind of peeling those guys now away. Now number three, we start from the east. Again, now, all those pixels here have neighbors to the east because one and two is now gone. Okay, so we start with this one over here. We say, okay, we have 
one, two, three neighbors. Okay, going to keep that. Start here. One, two, three, four neighbors. You want to start from the east, that's oh. on the right side, right? Yes, but I peeled. Yeah. The one is peeled away. Yeah, uh, sorry. Ah. Let's see if I screwed up my example in making this animation or if I, um, okay. Maybe it should be west. So probably it's just I made the wrong labeling in there. Um, let's see. Yes, it must be west. So this should be west. Sorry. So I'm here with three. Uh, one, two, three, four. Neighbors gone. I simply continue this process. The three goes away. And again, I have one where this has been eliminated. So I have just one, two, three neighbors. Add that. Ah, no, sorry. It has no, it has no border to the, uh, to the east. Therefore, that's not considered. Because this is still, this is still an element. So. so is it clear why we don't take this one? Yeah. Because there's no border from the west. No, no border from the west because this one is, is kept. My mistake. Three. And then there should be no more. Right. Four. Again, now we have go from the east. Um, and then we start with pixels from the east. So start here from the east. This one. One, two. OK, I keep that one. Then this one will be the next one. One, two, three, four neighbors can go away. Again, one, two, three, four, five neighbors can go away. So this one will be the next one. One, two, three neighbors only. Oh, I need to keep that one. So, and then we continue this process. We're going to restart from the north and continue like this until we kind of peeled away the whole thing with after six iterations. And these are those elements that actually maintained. I now do is okay. I take can simply everything else, all the numbers have been peeled away, and only the dots survived. So we can actually see it like this. So in the N8 neighborhood, this would be the graph structure that I have, where I say for every of those points, these are the maximum distances to the borders of my, um, to, to, to the borders of, to the background. Yes, please. Um, uh, I start with this one before I use this one. Um, so, so in five, okay. So five, so this one and this one are gone to five. So okay, let's start. I go from north. So I. This one, this one, and this one, I'm, and these guys I'm considering now, right? Yeah. Then all north are gone, and then I have the south pixel, which is this one. Sorry for that. I will update the figure and provide the correct figure next time. It's quite likely that there is a mistake. Um, so maybe six was not south. Maybe there was nothing in south. And then I started from the west again. So it's quite likely that simply my labeling is there was nothing for south. And then I start with west again. And then it was kind of the one which was taken from the west. Um, so what the, the skeleton can be seen as an approximation of the original shape by kind of reducing thick lines to thin lines. Of course, it's only done up to a grit, grit discretization. So the grit, we have this grit discretization, and it, it will not be perfect due to the disc, grit discretization. But if you make the grit smaller and smaller and smaller, my approximation should get better and better and better. Um, however. If I have an accurate, um, 
the, the, the diagram, so kind of, if I'm living in a continuous world, so assuming we are not in the grid world, and I have this medial axis diagram, I can actually see that as taking my circles and cutting out, so moving the circles along those lines, if I would store the radius for so the distance as well, I could actually cut out the figure again. So um, just the representation itself is not enough to resemble my original, original figure, but, but if I store the distances in there, I can actually kind of, like, this is also kind of sometimes called space carving. I can carve out the space and actually rebuild the original boundary. Any further questions on that? Okay, we have our graph. We can prune the graph, and this is typically a structure that you then will see for this skeleton. Um, however, it should be noted that these algorithms are actually not perfect. So there are a couple of issues we have in here. The first one is it's not rotational invariant. So if we rotate the figure by 90 degrees, I should intuitively get the same result, but since I start from north, south, west, east, I'm likely to make a mistake. Or it's, I, I'm not necessarily getting the same result. Also, it depends on my definition of what an endpoint is. So if I say, oh, I'm only interested with three which are an endpoint, I will actually get less, um, less connections in my graph. The other thing is it's computationally quite inefficient. So I have to make all those iterations, and it depends on the number of elements that I have because I need to check for every pixel, does it has a border? And I need to repeat that, which is proportional to the um, width or the thickness of my, of my um, figure. So the thicker, the, the, the thicker my figure is, the, more, the higher the complexity. That means the more operations I actually need to execute. We have digitalization issues. If you have problems with very small objects, we may not find a good skeleton in there. Just kind of have whatever, two pixels. I actually need to be sit somewhere in between. So I have discretization errors that I have. So there are faster approaches that actually use the distance transform. In which way do you think the, the distance transform could actually help me? First, we said we can actually compute the distance transform in linear time, so much faster than this one over here. If we take a figure, we said we want to have a skeleton, but we don't use this algorithm here. What we're going to use is we start with the distance transform. Let's say we compute the perfect Euclidean distance transform. So consider a figure where these are the borders. And so just for simplicity, I just cut out these. So this is a distance of 1, 2, 3, 2, 1. So this is the border, and this is the border. And I kind of get the same pattern here, up here and there. So we said already before what the skeleton is has something to do with maximizing, maximizing distances to borders. And this, what I can do is I simply can look in my distance field, my distance transform, and select peaks. So like maximine here. So if I move from here to here, and I would plot that as a curve, would have my maximum here. If I could draw perfectly, the maximum would actually sit here, like this. And these are actually the maxima in those distance transforms. So here would be a three as well, two, one, two, one, and so on. So it even could narrow down here, for example. Then we would have, let's say, for example, two, one, one, two, maybe two in here. Well, uh, three depending on my neighborhood. Two, two, one, one. Here we're going to have a two, uh, depending how narrow it gets. So let's say we move up here. And then if I, I can actually look for those, uh, for the regions where I have maxima in this function, I have to do that in 2D, of course, then I would actually get with this example, this line as my uh, medial axis representation. So how I can actually use the distance transform to speed up the skeleton searches. I compute the distance transform, which I can do in linear time. And what I then basically need to do, I need to search over the image and finding for those maxima. And the maxima I find by taking a point, considering its neighbors, and check if this value is higher than those of the neighbors. 
So something which is a local operation, I can actually do which, by just sliding through the image. So I need to visit every pixel and a couple of its neighbors, but there's something which I can actually do in constant time, in constant time sorry, in linear time, if I do this operation um, over the whole image. Okay? Last but not least, I would like to talk a little bit about features. We will also talk about features um, in the remaining of the course from time to time. Features are descriptions of an image, or can also be local, it can be local descriptions, but it can also be global descriptions, which describe the image or the a part of the image um, in a compact way. It may not be a, a mapping that I can map from the image to the feature and from the feature back to the image. So typically I lose some information if I map from the feature to my image, but it's a more compact representation of the binary image. So the feature can be seen, so we look here so far at the moment to features of, for example, the whole image or the, or the component or a component um, that describes certain properties. And we typically can distinguish between two different features. The one is kind of, are kind of topological features and the other one are geometric features. The idea of topological features is that they take into account the connection to neighboring elements. Where the geometry really describes the geometry, for example, the, the area or the perimeter of a, of a component. The advantage of topological features over geometric features is if I transform the image, typically those topological features um, are maintained. They are not kind of changed. Whereas geometrical features can be changed. So if I stretch an image, for example, I may change the diameter of a component. But topological features, which just take into account neighborhoods and neighborhood connections, are typically not destroyed by simple transformations of images. So if I, for example, count the number of components that I have in an image, of course, if I just count the number of components, I cannot recover where those components are. But if I, for example, want to analyze, um, um, let's say, handwritten digits, as you said before, I can actually use this as a feature to distinguish them. So if I have one shape, which let's say is an eight, compared to a zero, compared to a one. So this, this one has zero holes in the figure. This one has one hole, and this one has two holes. So in terms of the number of holes, I can actually separate elements. So if I have, at least if the person write that well, and kind of close the eight correctly over here, um, then by computing, for example, the number of holes for a region of the image allows me to say, if I get two holes, it's very unlikely that this is actually a one. It's actually very likely that this is an eight. Of course, a one and a two, at least if I write it like this, I can't distinguish. Someone else who may write a two like this may say, hmm, I don't know what it is. But at least we're pretty sure if you have two holes, it's unlikely that it is a two or a one. So these are features which allow me, or which are represent a description of the image or parts of the image, which is a simplified description, but which may be sufficient, for example, to do certain tasks, for example, to distinguish different types of um, digits. And typical topological features are, for example, the number of components or the number of holes, which we all know how we can compute that. We're just running the connected components algorithm and counting the number of different elements, components that I simply have. And again, for the holes, I just need to invert the image and can do the, uh, can do, uh, the comp analyze the number of components, need to subtract the background, but then I'm there. There's also another uh, one which relates the number of components and the number of holes with each other, which is the Euler characteristic, which is simply the number of components minus the number of holes. There's simply another feature which allows me, depending on if I kind of have separated parts, so if I have, for example, um, okay, for those, for letter, maybe for, for handwritten letters, for example, the I has two components, one component over here and one component over here compared to whatever an E, um, which only has one component. So, need to take into account component and holes, although now for the number of components minus the number of holes, they would both have a value of zero but would be different, for example, from k, 
which has more holes than components. OK, I don't want to dive more deeper into the topological features, um, but spend a little bit of time to look into the geometric features. Because the geometric features are features we use quite often. They are kind of a, too often a more, let's say, concrete description of the image, but still often don't allow for the mapping from the feature back to the image. So for example, the area that a foreground takes or the parameter that a foreground takes. There are several different shapes which can end up having the same parameter or the same area, but these are two typical features. So for example, if we have um, this one over here and we wanted to compute the area that this component takes, so how can we actually determine uh, the area of a binary image? That's actually very, very simple. We simply need to path through those images and, and ever we have a pixel which has a value of one, we increase a counter. We just need to count the, the gray pixels. If we just count the gray pixels, we can very easily compute the area. So computing the area, the foreground area of a binary image is something which is very simple. If we want to look to the parameter, so let's say we have these are our gray or our black pixels over here. How should we actually compute that? So what the parameter? The parameter is this distance over here. So it's the distance of u equals 6 in this example. Because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the question is, how do we obtain that? What about simply counting the, going through the image and counting the number of borders that every pixel has? We simply pass through the image and say how many borders are actually connected to that. If I do that, I actually get this result. So this one has no borders between foreground and background. This one has one. This one has one, zero, zero. This has one, this one over here. This one has three, one, two, three. This one has also one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So I sum that up. Actually, I end up with 12, which is clearly not what I wanted to do. But what basically happens is that we counted all those borders twice, one from the inside and one from the outside. So what I simply can do is simply say, oh, now I counted everything twice. So we can simply divide this value by 2. Okay, so it's very, very easy. You can say we count everything twice. So we simply get our result and or either divide it by 2 or I say I just count the, the only half of the border. So only the border to the, to the um, left or to the bottom. This was the example over here. Oh no, left, no, bottom right, sorry. Only the, or the, the upper bound, yeah, the, sorry, the upper boundary, left upper boundary. Okay, for this one, this, this one gets a value of zero because it has nothing on the upper left area. This one gets zero as well. This one gets zero as well. This one gets then two. This one gets one. There's only one over here, but this one still has one, and so on. So I end up having this pattern. If I sum those guys up, I actually end up with six, which is my parameter. If I path through the image like this, then may can get a little bit slow. So there's actually a faster way to do that and actually doing this with a lookup table. And the, the, the trick is to say, OK, what I do is I look to pairs of 2 by 2 pixels. So this is my image with 2 by 2 pixels. And I simply, uh, sorry, this one over here is what I'm considering. So I'm sliding over this image. And this is kind of the, uh, the area that I'm actually looking into. So this, this is a simple region. And there are different things that can happen. For example, these guys could be white, and this one could be black. So foreground and background. In this case, if we kind of slide this over my image, I can say the parameter in this area is actually 2. Oh, actually, one here to oh, it's it's half a pixel plus half a pixel, actually one, and the area that is within this um, red box is actually a quarter pixel. In this situation, however, I have the the area is 0.5, and here I actually have a border which is 0.5 plus 0.5, so equals one. So for all of those situations that I can have, I have a certain number of borders that I experience and a certain number um, 
of, of area that I need to add to that. So the trick is now to say, how many of those different configurations may I experience? So how many different configurations do I have in here, in this example? So I have two by two elements that I'm considering. They all can be zero and one. So the number of possibilities per pixel is two. I have four different pixels. How many combinations are possible? This can be zero, one, this can be zero, one, this can be zero, one, this can be zero, one. How many different possibilities do I have? 16. Yes, two to the power of four, and six, I have 16 different configurations. So what I can do is I simply create a small lookup table. This one over here, these are all possible configurations that I may experience, and simply Compute this once and then just go over my image and check what it is. So du is simply what I need to add to the parameter and df is what I need to add to the area. So in this situation, nothing needs to be added. If I'm in this situation, say, okay, for the parameter, I need to add one. And for the area, I need to add a, uh, a quarter. And for all these different situations, I have exactly this. have different values, but I just can experience all of them. I simply have all those 16 elements. So the question is now, so these are kind of the, uh, as a number, kind of an index, written binary, uh, so with um, base 2 and base 10, so 1 to 16, so or 0 to 15. And then the thing is now, how do I actually know in which situation I'm in? What I need to do is I need to analyze those four pixels over here. I can however do that quite easily by just using this equation over here, which says, okay, but the current pixel, the value of the current pixel corresponds to, the, to this bit. So it's either 0 or 1. This corresponds to this bit. The second pixel is the one which corresponds, uh, sorry, no, the first one, sorry, is this bit, the least significant bit. This part over here is what this bit actually shows me. So this is the first one, second. So this corresponds to this guy over here. This guy corresponds to this, sorry, this situation over here. So this corresponds to this area. This corresponds to this area. Then the first time we get four, this area corresponds to this. And the highest significant bit, which is this one, corresponds to this area. So by just doing this operation, I know which index I'm in. And then I simply add up the parameter and the area. You can do that actually in one go. So I can come up with a very simple algorithm which just says, okay, simply pass one th through the whole image. Compute this n for every pixel by just adding up four intensity, so four values in my binary image. This gives me the situation. And then update the parameter and update the area according to my lookup table. So this LOT, DF, and DU is exactly this lookup table. And this is exactly those numbers over here. It's just a small area with those numbers. So what I can do is I can very efficiently compute the parameter and the area over a whole, imi over a whole image just with one path through the image. Not needing to take care into account which components are connected, how they are connected. The, the area and the parameter is automatically computed in this way, just with one single path through the image. There are other geometric features which even relate those, which relate the parameter and the area, which is, for example, the form factor. Um, which, again, trades of the area and the parameter, um, which is often used, um, which has an advantage that actually this feature is invariant under scale changes. So if I kind of scale my image, so for example, uh, increase in size by a factor of two or reduce it by a factor of two, the parameter and the area actually change, but the scale factor stays the same. So if I want to analyze if an image has changed only by a transformation, I can actually compute my features. So parameter has changed, f has changed, but if k hasn't changed, it may be an indicator that it's invariant under scale changes. Or maybe I'm, I know that my image has been scaled, but I still want to be able to recognize the same object. So the um, scale factor, or for, it's not form, form factor, not scale factor, form factor, maybe one of those features that I should consider. 
So just a few examples how these look like. Again, U, F, and K for different kind of objects. And you see already here, just look to the individual pixels. So those elements are, n at least specific to the grid discretization, are not invariant under rotations, for example. So I have five pixels going up. I have five pixels on the diagonal actually get different values out. The area doesn't change, but the parameter changes and the form factor changes. This is one of those issues that I have if I actually map geometric objects into binary images that those features typically change and they're not constant just because of the discretization that I have. So if I would describe them as a continuous object and I would actually rotate them, I would actually end up in having a different uh, shape over here. Last but not least, there are a very common feature for binary images are the moments of an image. And depending on which moments I'm taking into account, this may even include higher order moments like the symmetry or asymmetry of distribution. So it's simply given so the moment KR is the ice coordinate, so the first coordinate to the power of K, the J's coordinate to the power of K, and then multiplied with the corresponding intensity value. So if you know this from continuous distribution, this, then you would need to take into account the integral as we are only working with binary images which are discrete structures we can actually take into account, compute the moments directly in some form. So we can first look into the, the moment M00. What is M00 actually giving me? So if M00 means i to the power of 0 is 1, j to the power of 0 is 1, and the bij actually remains. So what do I end up computing? What is M00 computing? Okay. The sum of all intensity values. The sum of, yes, intensity values, but we are just 0 and 1, our intensity values. And what is that? So the sum of all related um, pixels. Exactly, exactly, there's a foreground area. So it simply computes the area. So M00 computes me the area just by counting the number of pixels that have the value of 1. What I can also do is I can use this to compute the center of mass in i and in j, so in i's dimension and j's dimension. So what's kind of the center of mass of my component? Just take the moment m10 where j is gone away if just i times the intensity values normalized by the area. If I do this, so taking account M10 and M00, or M01 and M00, I can directly compute the center of mass of my, intent of my binary image. So the different moments can actually be used to compute different properties of the foreground in my image. So it's just a small example. So these are my foreground pixels. I, of course, have a center of mass in one direction. So in the i-th direction would be 2.25. And in the j's direction, it, in this case, would be 3. But just taking into account the individual values, dividing by the number of elements that I have in here. And it can continue like this with different moments, telling me different things about my binary image. One of the elements are the central moments. So these are those moments which where I subtract the individual indices or x or y locations or x row and column indices by the mean. So it's just exactly the same equation I had before except that I add here i minus the center of mass in i and j minus the center of mass in j. So kind of the central moments. And then again, if I take into account the central moment 0, 0, I actually end up again getting the area because the area doesn't move if I kind of just change my location. And of course, the mean over those, so the, uh, not the mean, the, if I set either a k or r to 1, what I do is, for example, if I set k to 1 and r stays 0, I just count how many pixels are left of the center of mass and how many pixels are right of the center of mass, and this should be 0, right, because 
If I know the center of mass, the number of pixels right of the center of mass and left of the center of mass should be the same. So this actually turns out to be zero for x and y. And one of the other important things you also know are kind of the second central moments. I can actually build up a matrix using the second central moments. So 2, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 1 in there. And if I then normalize this by the area, I actually obtain the covariance matrix. If I treat the distribution of um, intensity values or 0 and 1 values as a probability distribution. And if it's a uniform probability distribution, where the probability, it models the probability, the, the variance of the probability distribution modeling if a pixel takes a value of zero, uh, so is a foreground or background pixel, sorry, not taking zero once because it's normalized by the area, but the probability um, that um, a pixel is a foreground pixel or a background pixel. Once I have the covariance matrix, I can actually look into the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix. What does this tell me? If you have a Gaussian distribution, you look to the covariance matrix of this Gaussian distribution and you compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What do they tell you intuitively or visually? You should have all worked with Gaussian distributions and looked to covariance matrices, I guess. What does it mean if one eigenvalue is large and one I the other eigenvalue is small in this 2D case? So I have one large eigenvalue. That means the, the direction of the corresponding eigenvalues, eigenvalue of the figure is stretched out, and the other one is actually very small. The eigenvector, the, the eigenvector corresponding to the large eigenvalue points you actually in the direction where there's the largest spread of this image in the 2D world. And I actually can compute this just by taking into account the different values of this matrix M. And I can actually compute the um, direction of the eigenvectors. So I have the main axis and then actually know in which, di in which direction the binary Im image actually is stretched or has a larger extent, it's not necessarily stretched, has a larger extent than in the smaller area. Okay, okay, I can skip that. So in the last and third moment to look into um, tells me actually something how screwed the distribution is. If I'm in the 1D case and I have the third moment uh, taken into account and what I, and the the, the variance to the, to the power of 3, I actually get the screwness of a distribution. So if this takes a value that is um, larger than 0, it's actually screwed to an asymmetry to the left. And if it's smaller than 0, an asymmetry to the right. And you can directly compute those values from my distribution. If I do this for the individual axis separately, so computing the major axis, which for this distribution would be this coordinate system, and then look into the screwness of the individual or the asymmetry of the individual dimensions. You see that here's a large asymmetry to the right because it's kind of this part of the L, whereas in this dimension it's rather small. So it's close to zero and this actually has a large negative value. And the important thing is that I can actually compute this also directly from my binary image. The only thing I need to compute is the direction of the eigenvalue, eigenvectors, which you see it corresponds to u and v. So this is the one with the large extent, and the one the corresponding to the largest eigenvalue and corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue. And then I can directly compute those parameters by just putting in the exact equations that I had before. So this was more or less, I know that the last couple of minutes were just basically a list of different features that we have, but actually in the homeworks we will actually start using those features, especially towards the end of the course, in order to do classification tasks. So classification system need features in order to, to make a decision, for example, which kind of digit has the person written down. You can actually use those features and then actually learn classifier, classification system, 
which based on those features is in the end able to distinguish the different handwritten digits, for example. You can actually do this based on those features over here. So the moments can encode several relevant things like the area, the center of mass, what's the direction of the main extent of, these, um, of the binary image. Um, the asymmetry is also something which is very important in a lot of classification system. And the important thing is all those things actually can be computed in a single path through the image. And this actually concludes the chapter on binary images. So what we have last done in the beginning of last week, in the end of the course last week, and today was actually looking into what are binary images, what are connected components, what are typical operators, just looking into a very few. We will actually dive more into operators in the next weeks. We looked into distance transform, what the skeleton is, and what typical features are and what typical features can be used for. Again, Wolfgang Firstner's script covers most of the aspects here except of the um, erosion operators, um, but you find actually a pretty good description in chapter 3.3 .3 in the Tzeliski book, um, which you have the draft also available of that book, which is available as a PDF file for free. That's it from my side. Is, are there any questions? <laughs> yes, please. So I know, so the last five minutes was, if you want to, so the thing is you have different types of, the last five minutes were a bit fast, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, the, the, the key take home message for this is there are different types of features and these moments are one attractive way for deriving different types of features. And they code things like area, center of mass, what's the extent of an object in a certain direction, what is the symmetry of this binary image. If you want to analyze images, which typically do we extract a large number of features and then based on those features do your analysis like a classification system, which could say, is this an eight, is this a zero, is this a one? And based on those features, which you can actually compute with those tools, you're actually able to derive such a classification system. And this is something we will do toward the end of the course after we have looked into classification algorithms but in order to run those classification algorithm, algorithms, we need to understand those features. And so this was more or less a list of features that I provided, and you will have to go back to them at some point, implement them in MATLAB, um, extract those feature values on images, and then work with those feature values. That's it from my side, and thank you very much for your attention.